Hello, and uh, welcome to this edition of Represent NYC on Manhattan's Neighborhood Network. I'm Assemblymember Harvey Epstein. I represent Assembly District 74, which covers the east side of Manhattan. Today I'll be talking about the rent regulation laws with Marcel Martinez from Neighbors Helping Neighbors and Caitlin Chan from Met Council on Housing. Thank you both for being here today. Thanks so Thank much you. for having us. Sure. So we're talking about the rent laws and the expiration of the rent laws. Marcel, can you talk about the history of rent regulation and how it got into effect here in New York? Sure. Um, so uh, what we're talking about when we talk about rent regulation is rent stabilization. And that started in the 70s when New York City realized it was a housing crisis. Um, the vacancy rate was 5% or less. And as long as it continues that way, we are going to continue to be in a housing crisis. And these laws are going to continue to be renewed. So in the 70s in New York, we saw a lot of increasing rents and the concerns around protecting those tenants and lower than 5% vacancy rate. Uh, so Gaitlin, tell me about what Metropolitan Council of Housing did in response to those issues. Yeah, so it's all about tenant organizing and making sure that tenants understand that they have power in um, and say in, in their housing choices. Um, and so many, many tenants across the city came together and made sure that our um, state legislators passed housing uh, legislation that helped tenants stay in their homes, kept rents at a, a limited increases, um, and really stabilized the market in the way that needed to happen um, for the crisis that was happening in 1974. So, and I, we hear a lot about this being the city, New York City, but it, in fact it affects other parts of the state as well. Is that right, Marcella? Yeah, so rent stabilization currently exists in New York City and a couple of the counties, but it doesn't exist in the other parts of the state. And why doesn't it exist in other parts of the state? That's a good question. That's actually one of the bills that we're trying to move forward is an expansion of the ETPA, and that's the um, Emergency Tenant Protection Act and what it would do is it would allow counties upstate to opt into rent stabilization if they choose to. So if they're having a housing crisis they would also have their own um, vacancy survey and they would determine for themselves the option to opt into the program which they cannot do as of right now. So as the law is right now it's only for New York City and some counties in Westchester or on Long Island. This could expand it statewide. Correct. But there are, are restrictions around. What are those, some of those restrictions on what could be regulated? So we're talking about rent stabilization, and so the counties would decide if they want to opt in. But we do have another bill. Um, just on this, if we could just sure. for a moment here. So the criteria, though, is it has to be buildings that are like six or more units. Six or units built prior to 1974. Right. So, and what's the vacancy rate would have to be in those counties? So it would have to be five percent or less. Right. So the so we're talking about some counties, like it might be in Buffalo and Syracuse, you might right. have low vacancy and older buildings. But some counties around the state, you wouldn't see a lot of. They don't have larger buildings where they have six or more units. Correct. And again, the counties would be determining themselves through um, this vacancy survey and determining if they want to opt into it. Mm -hmm. And so around the state, to, so besides these counties, there aren't those type of rent protections that exist? Unfortunately, no. Rent stabilization is very unique. It's um, in New York, some places in California, and some in San Francisco. But it's not something that's statewide or nationwide. So, Caitlin, I know, I know there's concerns. We've, you know, I've been at hearings all over the state yeah. and around this issue that are affecting other parts. We were in Rochester the other day. The uh, Senate was up, you know, in uh, Newburgh. Can you tell why yeah, it doesn't exist and what opportunities might be to expand protections for other people around the state? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the important thing here is that it's not going to be a blanket like we were just talking about. Not, it's not all apartments all of a sudden are all going to become regulated. It really is a process that needs to, um, to take place. Um, and tenants, I know we, you know, we're in the city, we concentrate in the city, but tenants around the state really are facing the same things we are. We're facing evictions without cause, where they can just be evicted at the end of their lease, even if they've been a fantastic tenant. Right. Or they have a rent that could jump 20, 30, 40 percent at the whim of the landlord, um, and really just allows for no protections um, for that person to be secure with their job. Maybe they have to move out of that city or that town because there's no other affordable housing. So the, the goal of this is to really secure people in their homes, which secures people in their city and in their economy. I mean, it's a really huge part 
of um, you know of, of keeping a city vibrant and people away from homelessness. So you just mentioned like a uh, good cause. So can you talk a little more about what that would look like so our viewers can understand what that good cause bill would do for people who are not protected by rent regulations? Sure. I think part of it is also understanding that um, as we said, rent stabilization is for older buildings, larger, uh, larger buildings, six units or, or more, but there's a lot of private houses that are used as um, units that pe uh, house people. We also have small buildings and we also have market rate tenants. And so all of these tenants are not regulated. And what we mean is touching on um, the points that were made, they don't have a right to a lease. They don't have a right to a lease renewal. They face arbitrary rent increases and um, they live month to month and there's no defense against evictions. And so we're seeing these in, in neighborhoods in the city like Sunset Park in Brooklyn, where there is a lot of two and three family houses that are being used. And also, particularly, this is affecting a lot of tenants upstate that are living in units that are not regulated and so wanting to add additional protections that they don't currently have now. Right, you know, I was up in Rochester the other day and. 25% of all tenants living in Rochester move every year. So this, this story that you're telling that you see in Brooklyn is exactly the same thing you'll see in Rochester, mm -hmm. where this people have no housing stability. And why is that so negative, what, you know, moving from year to year? Why is that negative in people's lives? Well, if we're talking about families, um, there's no stability. Um, children having to go to school and it really is about this increase in rent mm -hmm. and so we're also taking folks away from their community so there this opportunity to actually you know have roots and be part of a community is also being destabilized you know some parts of the state you we we hear a lot about the rents aren't really changing that much so if the rents aren't changing people can or the vacancy is not that uh, low why can't they just move from place to place why does that matter so much I mean, even a move across a neighborhood from, you know, four train stops away can completely disrupt somebody's life. If they have childcare that's four stops away, they are now having to add maybe an hour to their, um, to their commute to work, and that might be taking time out of actually the amount of hours that they can actually work. Um, and disruption in families. Families need to stay together. Kids should be allowed to stay in their schools, and if you have to move from, um, you know, uh, Virgil Queens, where I live, to Jamaica Queens to get an affordable apartment, your your child might be changing schools, and that's very disruptive. And um, a child has a right to stay in their community with their family and in the schools that they grew up going to. Yeah, I think it's also, I mean, this risk, people who are renters obviously are in the same economic conditions that people who own. Right. So the instability is people who are, you know, the cost, of, the cost of moving. And first month's rent, yeah, security, sometimes last month's rent, and that cost of moving. And yeah. we're also seeing that, you know, the reason the homeless, the homeless numbers are rising is because there's people that are in the shelters that are working full time and have the means to pay rent. They can't find an affordable apartment is the problem. Yeah, yeah, what, uh, you know, close to 90,000 homeless New Yorkers across the state. 60,000 in New York City alone. Yeah, yeah it is a crisis. Um, so let's move on. You know, we've talked a little about good cause, and that bill really would be a statewide effect. Some of the uh, other bills that are in the uh, housing package really focuses on the re regulated housing stock. Mm -hmm. So you, can you talk about some of the changes that you're looking to see this year in the rent laws? I think two of the most important ones are eliminating um, major capital improvements, or what we call... Can you explain what major capital improvements or are? what we call MCIs. <laughs> um, so that is when a building owner can do upgrades to a building that really, in other places, might be just a cost of doing business, and they then push that cost onto the tenants for the life of that lease. Mm. It's not just to recover their costs, but they then can just increase that rent. It, it, it oftentimes is hundreds of dollars per apartment. Right. Um, and you know, landlords take advantage of this by putting in a new staircase where a staircase was fine before, right. um, making upgrades that the building didn't need because they know that they can increase the rent in these apartments by 15, 20% across the entire building 
for then ever. Um, and that's uh, been a real big cause of evictions right. for tenants. We're, we're also can it's just, is there an approval yeah. process through this uh, major capital improvement? And maybe we can talk about how that process works. Yeah, too. so the owners have to apply to the state mm -hmm. and um, the state then notifies the tenants and mm -hmm. the tenants can then challenge it. What we're seeing more and more is owners having attorneys preparing all these documents and they can be hundreds of pages mm. that a tenant is not used to um, seeing, understanding, or reading, but also um, understanding that there is abuse with this system, mm -hmm. right? A lot of the times they're coming into communities like mine, um, which is predominantly working class immigrant community. They're buying these properties and they're doing these MCIs, these major capital improvements to change the appearance of the building to attract new tenants. Mm -hmm. So when the new tenants are coming in, they see a nice shiny building, new staircase, new entry system, and what they're not realizing is that they're long-term tenants that are living there, and their apartments are not in the same conditions as, the, as these new ones are, and they're also not getting basic services like repairs. Right, so they're, the landlords are using major capital improvements to improve the building, uh, so, and you said there's a state agency. How is How's the state agency? Are they critical of the landlord's applications? What's their approval rate? rate? They seem like they're very landlord friendly yeah. and just rubber stamp all the applications. Right. Um, and so it's something like a 90% approval rating. Yes. So, the, so far. That's pretty high if you think about applying for anything and you get 90% approval. Yeah, and it's not just one um, application. We're seeing various applications happening at the same time right. where we're seeing um, the rents adding up to something like $400 a month yeah. per apartment. Yeah, one development in my district in Stuyvesant Town, yes. there's 26 MCIs pending right now. Yeah. So yeah, you see that rampant <coughs> rent increases that results in displacement. Mm -hmm. So what's your plan for MCIs? What is the coalition trying to do? Um, reform it and just get rid of it altogether. So, so that's the way that's the way we want to we want to do um, uh, getting back to what was said, this is in permanent increase for the tenants, for the tenancy completely. Right. So a tenant will move out because they can't afford a $400 increase, a new tenant's coming in, they're still paying that increase. So in, in, in essence, what we're doing is trying to get rid of the whole system altogether. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, there are caps on how much increases can happen per year. Yes. So it wouldn't be a 400 in one year. It wouldn't, but over time, we're talking about this being an increase that is big enough that will cause displacement. Right. And mm -hmm. these types of displacements are not being recorded through the eviction because they're not happening right. in housing court. So it's not sustainable. Right. So the rents just keep going up, right? Yeah. Great. So what, another bill that you guys are focusing on? So there's a few bills like that. Um, the focus is on... Um, trying to curb down the rent increases, trying to... So is there are specific bills to try to curb the rent yeah. increases? So there's uh, something called an IAI, Individual Apartment Improvement, which works the same way as the MCI, but instead of so building-wide... Individual Apartment Improvement. Right. So, so that's a term of art that people... So people are looking at it, they can, they can look up Individual Apartment Improvements. Correct. Mm -hmm. And essentially what's happening is when the apartments are becoming vacant, they're being completely renovated, mm -hmm. and the renovation allows for a rent increase. So the landlord has a vacant apartment, they spend like hundred thousand claims to spend a hundred thousand right. dollars in improvements and then they double the rent. Correct. So how are we going to change that? What's the plan? So we want to eliminate them as well. But so we eliminate them then we're not gonna allow a landlord to improve their building. Isn't that gonna worsen the housing stock? Well a landlord can absolutely improve their building. Um, they have they are profitable and they do have money that they can reinvest in their building, but they won't be able to pass those costs on to a tenant in a way that makes that tenant, uh, makes that apartment unaffordable. But don't you think, uh, Marcel, this would disincentivize landlords from doing work if we get rid of the major capital improvements and individual apartment improvements? The problem that we're seeing is we're seeing um, private equities buying up these apartments with a lot of money with the purpose of turning over. So what we want can, to do is... Explain private equity because for our viewers maybe they don't understand this issue. Sure. Uh, we have companies that take uh, get investment money, right? And so they have um, they have investors that they have to answer to. And so what they're trying to do is make a profit off of their money. And so what they've been able to do or what they're doing um, again in, in gentrifying neighborhoods like Sunset Park is they're buying up a lot of these housing stock um, rising, making the rents go up, and then trying to take them out of rent stabilization, which is one of the bills that was covered. 
and then converting what we know as affordable units into market rate. And it's that's when they're starting to make their money. So you're seeing this kind of large amount of capital coming from around the country and around the world investing in the New York City market, trying to get a better rate of return and Correct. paying too much for the property. Yeah, and so, so what happens is sometimes they're over leveraged and mm -hmm. in order to be able... When you say over leveraged, explain that. That means they get a loan to buy the property and they can't pay back the loan based on the current rent roll. Mm. So in order to be able to pay back that, that loan and make the investment, make the money, um, the investment, um, the return for their investors, they need to be able to collect more. And the way they collect more is getting rid of the old lady that's been there for years, fix up her apartment, and get someone from Manhattan who can't afford to live in Manhattan right. into Brooklyn or to Queens, where they're getting a much better deal. All right, so this is the way how we see gentrification displacement happening all over New York City. Correct, and it's also um, the landlords, when they're renting an apartment, there's also this understanding that there's repair and maintenance that has to go with it. So tenants are paying their monthly rent, so they're expecting services. So what we have been hearing is pushback on property owners saying, well, if you get rid of the MCIs and you get rid of the IAIs, we're not fixing our buildings and they're gonna, right. you know, they're, deteriorate. they're gonna deteriorate. And I was like, well, that's actually illegal. You can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can't afford to manage your property, then you should cut your losses and sell it and, take, and have somebody that can't take care of it. Yeah. Well, you know, obviously we want a strong housing stock. I mean, you've, I've heard that story before, but if you look at what's called net operating income for property owners, you've seen that their, the, the values of their buildings have been continuing to go up, and you look at their value of what we call profit continue to go up. They used to be, they used to spend 68 cents per dollar on a building, now it's down to 57 cents per dollar. So landlords are doing better, even if they have to invest a little more in major capital improvements. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. So uh, there's a lot around what's called preferential rents. Mm -hmm. Can, uh, Caitlin, can you talk, yeah. little, explain prefer preferential rents? To sure. So uh, if your uh, apartment is under rent regulation, right. you have what's called a legal rent, which is the legal amount a landlord can charge you. Oftentimes that legal amount is higher than what a person coming into the neighborhood might be able to afford or really would pay for uh, right. that apartment. So a landlord can offer you what's called a preferential rent, mm. which is lower than what he's allowed to charge you. Now what happens is at lease renewal, he can charge you as, he can increase your rent as much as he wants to reach the legal amount, which often can be a difference of hundreds of dollars. Uh, so a, legal, a rent stabilized apartment that normally would have an increase of between like one and four percent can see a jump of 15 to 20 percent. Right. And so what we'd like to do is eliminate that ability for a landlord to increase right. the rent to legal rent within the tenancy. So a, a one person in that apartment would only see their uh, rent go up by the rent guidelines board, which right. um, determines how much a rent regulated apartment can go up. Well, and that's the story. We were, some ways we were talking about earlier. When you move in, there's stability in staying, so you see those big jumps. It forces people to move to place to place. Um, I've heard a lot of stories around uh, people getting thinking that preferential rent was the actual rent, and then learning later about it. Have you either of you heard those stories? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the tenants are referring to preferential leases as a big ugly or the bait and switch is what I've heard mm. right because as tenants no one's explaining to us what's happening mm. we're signing a lease um, and some tenants are afraid to ask they see two numbers right one much larger than the other yeah. and the smaller number is the rent that they're actually paying so out of fear and fear coming from not knowing your rights they're afraid to ask questions right that makes a lot of sense so the, so you're planning to end uh, the right for landlords to go from the preferential to a legal rent Correct. Right. We want to make the preferential rents the legal rents. For the life of those tenants' tenancies. Yes. Now, have you also heard about legal rents actually not even being legal, even though it's the registered rent? We see that. I see that a lot in Sunset Park. Mm. Um, and so when tenants come in um, and they're asking questions, their first question is, is this a legal increase? Mm. And what they're talking about is going from the preferential rent that they were paying mm. to the legal rent amount. Um, there's a gentleman in Sunset Park who was having issues. I think his preferential rent was 1500 and the landlord was claiming that the legal rent for the apartment was actually four thousand mm. dollars. That's a big difference. And in fact, if and the rent, that rent was legal at all, well, I could say that the rent was not legal because if it was in, in fact 
legal for him to be able to charge the four thousand dollars then it wouldn't even be rent stabilized right. so mm -hmm. this is the type of abuse that we're seeing in our communities right. well talking about the four thousand dollar rents uh, there's been you know the historically since the uh, 1990s there's been an ability for landlords to get apartments out of rent regulation yes um, so what what how has that had any impact on the housing stock and the rent regulated housing stock in new york I think that's one of the um, biggest impacts that the housing market has had since 1994. Uh, it has set a goal for landlords to reach where they no longer have to have a rent, like, rent regulations uh, barring them from increasing their, their rents. Uh, and so that's been the game for the last 25 years. How quickly can you get it to that number, which increases small, a small amount every few years. Right now it's around $2,700. Um, but with the vacancy increases that they can charge when a uh, tenant leaves, mm -hmm. with the IAIs, the MCIs, it's giving all these landlords tools to get to that number. And once they are reached that number, then they can evict their tenants at the end of the lease. They can raise the rent as much as they want, and it is a very destabilizing tool. So, so, so it seems like the whole system has been created around incentivizing landlords to get to that goal of deregulation. So that's what that's what that that seems like. It's it, it's really acting as an incentive. Mm -hmm. And so what property owners want is they want to be able to convert these affordable units into market rate. Mm -hmm. A lot of them don't want to follow regulations and rules. You know, they feel like they buy the property, they should be able to determine how it's managed. And what I always say is, then stop buying the rent stabilized apartments. Right. Yeah. And that's how many units have we lost over time in this regulated housing stock? Oh, that's a big number. I, I'm not sure I have it off 10, I want yeah. some 500,000 or something. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a really big, yes. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of yeah. units. Yeah, so it's a issue. And so what's the goal here on uh, vacancy? Are we trying to change that? Yeah, we want to get r rid of that threshold altogether. I think what we saw in 2015 at the time of the renewals mm -hmm. was um, that all, all all that we got was just a raise in the threshold of two th $200, right? So mm -hmm. we went from uh, 2500 to 2700 and that was a threshold. That really did nothing. And so what we're seeing and what we're seeing is the depletion of the largest affordable housing stock that New York City has. Well, I I know this is uh, really helpful and really good information, but what do you suggest to people who are watching this you know, over the next three weeks to the rent lows, as we said, expire June 15th? What do you, what do you want to suggest people do to get involved in this? Um, I think as tenants, they need to understand what kind of housing they have. Um, they need to plug into the campaign and understand the bills that we're passing. And they need to... How, well, how do they do that? How do they plug mm -hmm. in? Well, part of it is understanding what type of housing you have. Uh, so we usually identify between regulated and unregulated. Regulated is the rent stabilization that we're talking about. Any building uh, built prior to 1974, six units or mm -hmm. more, is most likely rent stabilized. So is there an organizing effort that, that yeah. they can plug into? Is like there a place that they can go? Yeah. So uh, the coalition the campaign that we have is housing justice for all and mm. we do have a website so they can just google housing justice for all yeah and the website comes up the platform um, you can get in touch with local community organizations like my council or neighbors helping neighbors in brooklyn mm -hmm. great and any suggestions you have for, for Caitlin to get people to be involved in this conversation? Yeah, I think um, across whatever housing you're in, these bills will likely affect you and keep you safe as a tenant. So go to housingjusticeforall.org slash platform. Right. Get to know all nine bills. Right. Call one of these organizations, send us an email. We have a few weeks left to actually get involved. We're going up to Albany a number of times a week to talk to legislators, right. talk to your neighbors, um, and uh, just make sure people know how important it is to get mm -hmm. these bills passed. It isn't every Tuesday, it's called a Tenant yes. Tuesday, right? Yes. So tenants are coming up every Tuesday. We're going up to Albany, we're talking with our legislators, so I think that would be the other step is mm -hmm. find out who your assembly member is, find out who your state senator is, and call them and make Make sure that they are talking about this and they are supporting this. When you say call them, what do you want them to call them about the bills or what do you want them yeah, to do? Yeah, they need to know that there's bills that can actually bring relief now right. to tenants who are suffering. Right, and this is anywhere in the state, right? Exactly. Yeah. And to, you know, specifically ask them 
to ask your legislators for vote for the to vote for these bills as they are now, mm. not to water them down. These bills have been thought about and developed for years. They are not on a whim. They are specifically written to protect tenants as much as we need them to be protected. So pass the bills as they are, and we want to encourage Cuomo to to pass them as they well, are. As you well. do it's good to mention the governor. Yeah. So it isn't just the assembly and the Senate right. that kind of will decide this. There are part of you know, the legislature. Yeah. Um, what do you think the governor's role will be in this? Well, what we'd like to see is uh, we'd like to see all nine bills passed because the housing crisis really needs uh, the bills are going to work collectively and cohesively. Well, so what we need is we need them to pass and then the governor, actually the governor has the power. He can decide right now to sign all nine bills and bring relief to much needed tenants in New York. Right. So really, so talk to the governor, talk to the assembly yes. and senators. This has been a great discussion. Thank you, Caitlin and Marcella, for being here and sharing your insights for Represent NYC. I'm Assemblymember Harvey Epstein. Please contact my office at 212-979-9696 with any suggestions you have about how to tackle these issues or general questions and comments. Thank you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan's Neighborhood Network.